MSI's GP66 is a cheaper version of the higher tier GE66 gaming laptop, but they've still kept the most important parts needed to offer a great gaming experience. So let's find out which extras they've removed in order to offer this cheaper machine. My GP66 has Intel's Core i7 12700H CPU, Nvidia RTX 3070 Ti graphics, 16 gigs of DDR4 memory, and a 15.6 inch 1440p 165Hz screen. But you can check out other configurations and current prices with the links below the video. Just before we dig into the review, Galax have sponsored this part of the video for me to tell you about their end of summer sale with M-Wave. Yeah, you heard right, it's an end of summer sale because it's for Australians like me who live upside down in the southern hemisphere. You can get the Galax GeForce RTX 3050 EX graphics card which offers great performance in games when combined with Nvidia's DLSS. And you can also get get their Sonar 04 gaming headset with it for free during this promotion. Or if you want the chance to win the RTX 3050 EX, then just buy a Galax gaming mouse or keyboard to enter the giveaway. All you'll need at that point is their Vivance 01 27 inch 1440p 165Hz gaming monitor with G-Sync and you'll be set for gaming. You can check out these Galax products in the end of summer sale at M-Wave with the sponsored links in the video description. Alright, back to the last laptop. Just like last year's version, the 2022 GP66 has an all black metallic finish for both the lid and interior. There aren't any sharp corners or edges, and overall, build quality felt good. It's a bit of a fingerprint magnet, but I found it easy enough to clean with a microfiber cloth. There wasn't much flex to the keyboard, even when pushing down hard. It felt sturdy during normal use. The lid doesn't flex too much, however I found that the screen would wobble a little when typing. Despite that, the hinges felt sturdy when opening and moving the lid. Although hinges have been an issue for previous MSI laptops, unfortunately it's not something I can cover in depth without long term testing and this is still a brand new machine. I found the lid easy to open despite no dedicated spot on the front for getting your finger into. And the screen can go back about 140 degrees. The laptop alone weighs under 2.35 kilos or 5.2 pounds and goes up to 3.4 kilos or 7.5 pounds with a fairly chunky 280 watt power brick and cables for charging. There's no type C charging with the GP66 either, so you're stuck with that large brick. The GP66 has the exact same dimensions as the higher tier GE66. It's a little thicker at the back compared to others, but not massive. Like last year's model, the GP66 has a mock switch, so we've got the option of disabling Optimus for better performance in games, but at the expense of worse battery life. Adaptive sync is possible with Optimus on but there's no G-Sync or Advanced Optimus. The 1440p screen has quite good colour gamut, though contrast was a little lower compared to others I've tested, but expect different results with the 1080p screen option. The brightness didn't quite get to 300 nits at maximum. 300 is the minimum I want to see, but this is close enough. The MSI Centre software, the control panel for the laptop, lets us enable or disable display overdrive, which affects screen response time. With overdrive disabled, we're looking at an 8 millisecond and average greater gray response time. But with overdrive enabled, which is the default, this lowers to 4.55 milliseconds. But it did introduce some overshoot and undershoot. It's a great result when compared to most other gaming laptops. It's only beaten slightly by other similar 165Hz high resolution panels in ASUS and Lenovo machines. Screen response time is a factor that contributes to total system latency. This is the total amount of time between a mouse click and when a gunshot fires on the screen in C go, and the GP66 was doing reasonably well compared to others here too. Backlight bleed wasn't too bad. I didn't actually notice the top left patch during regular use, it only became apparent when I took this worst case photo, but this will vary between laptops. There's a 720p camera above the screen in the middle, so not quite the 1080p camera that the higher tier GE66 has, and there's no face unlock here. This is what the camera and microphone look and sound like, so the quality is a bit grainy despite the fact that I'm currently well lit. And this is what it sounds like while typing on the keyboard, and as you can see there is a little bit of screen wobble. And now this is what it sounds like with the fan on full speed. So you can still hear me okay over the fan lines.
Unlike the more expensive GE66, there's no RGB light bar on the front, so definitely expect less performance in games due to that. I was surprised to see that the GP66 still has perky RGB backlighting. I kind of expected the higher GE66 to have that and just see a single zone here, but that wasn't the case. All keys and secondary functions get lit up too. It's got four levels of key brightness, which can be adjusted by holding function and pressing the F10 and F11 shortcuts. While holding function, Function, you can see other keys in red that you can interact with. Unfortunately, the brightness of the red keys doesn't change as you make adjustments, so you have to let go of the function key to see the current brightness. Typing was okay. The key presses felt a bit shallow compared to other laptops. Although the power button is right next to the delete key, I didn't find any accidental presses to put it to sleep despite this being the default setting in Windows. You had to hold it for quite a while before Windows would ask if you want to shut down. I personally didn't like using the touchpad. It felt small and the click didn't feel as nice compared to others that we're currently testing like the M16. There's also a small gap down the front that I'm sure dirt and dust will get into over time. The left has a Kensington lock at the back, an air exhaust fan battery charge light, USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A port, USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C port, 3.5mm audio combo jack, and side speaker grill towards the front. The right also has a speaker grill, but otherwise just has two more USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A ports, and there's an air exhaust on this side too. The rest of the ports are on the back between two more air exhausts. From left to right, we've got a mini DisplayPort 1.4 output, 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, which is unfortunately facing the annoying way where you've got to lift the back up to actually unplug it, followed by a HDMI 2.1 output and the power input on the right. I was kind of surprised to see 2.5 gigabit Ethernet because I figured that was still a more premium feature that would be left for the higher tier GE series. Unfortunately, the single Type-C port cannot be used to charge the laptop and it does not have Thunderbolt 4 like the higher tier GE66. So just another cost saving measure for the GP series. The Type-C port does also offer DisplayPort 1.4 support and that in combination with the mini display port and HDMI on the back all connect directly to the Nvidia graphics whether or not Optimus is enabled or disabled. We also confirmed the HDMI port supports G-Sync, so variable refresh rate, and it supported an external screen at 4K 120Hz 8-bit. There are 11 Phillips head screws to remove to get inside, and two are shorter than the rest so keep track of them. This was the hardest gaming laptop I've ever opened, I almost gave up. There were so many plastic tabs on the bottom panel that I constantly felt like I was going to break it, and at least one of them did snap off, so it was a bit easier to open the second time around. If you ever get inside, you've got access to the battery down the front, two M.2 storage slots just above on the left, two DDR4 memory slots to the right of those, followed by the Wi-Fi 6 e card on the far right. Intel 12th gen supports either DDR4 or DDR5 memory, just not in the same laptop, and MSI have chosen to stick with DDR4 with the GP66. While the higher tier GE66 uses DDR5. Probably a good choice given the extra cost of DDR5 at the moment. And the DDR4 memory in my unit was X82 and not the slower X16 stuff. Wi-Fi performance was good, not too much below a number of other similar Intel Wi-Fi options. I took a full point from the upgradability score from the ease of access section, simply due to how difficult it was to open. Once you do get inside though, you can make a good amount of upgrades. The speakers are found on the left and right sides towards the front. I didn't think they sounded very good. They're muffled at higher volumes but sounded a little better at 25% or lower. I definitely stick to headphones. Like most 12th gen gaming laptops with Windows 11 this year, it didn't pass the latency mon test. The GP66 is powered by a 4 cell 65 watt hour battery, another cut down from the higher 99.9 watt hour battery found in the more expensive GE66. The MSI Center software has display power saver enabled by default. This lowers the screen's refresh rate down to 60Hz when you unplug the charger, which helps increase battery life. It automatically reverts back to the full refresh rate when you reconnect the charger, but unlike ASUS laptops, I didn't find this to disable panel overdrive, which may give a further battery improvement. We're getting about half the runtime if we disable Optimus and run purely off the more power-hungry Nvidia graphics. It's not doing very well compared to most other gaming laptops either. Other MSI laptops with larger batteries 
batteries were able to last longer, but ultimately I think it's being held back by the Intel processor, because the whole top section of the graph with the highest results are all AMD Ryzen machines. Let's check out thermals next. There are some heat pipes shared between the CPU and GPU, with two fans which exhaust air out of the left, right and rear. Cool air comes in from underneath, and there are plenty of ventilation holes directly above the intake fans. The MSI Center software lets us change between different performance modes. From lowest to highest we've got silent, balanced and extreme performance. Extreme performance applies a small 100MHz overclock to the GPU core by default, but you've got the option of customising it here. We can also enable cooler boost which sets the fan to max speed, or select advanced to customise each fan a bit. It's also possible to manually boost the fan in any mode with the function plus F8 shortcut. The temperatures were fine when just sitting there idle. The rest of the results are from combined CPU and GPU stress tests, which aim to represent a worst case. Nvidia GPUs thermal throttle at 87 degrees Celsius, and this was being hit in silent, balanced and extreme modes in this very heavy workload. Turning cooler boost on to max out the fan was a able to remove it by lowering the CPU and GPU temperatures by around 7 degrees Celsius. The cooling pad I test with, linked below the video, could also be used to further lower temperatures too. The CPU in the blue bars wasn't thermal throttling though. These are the clock speeds for the same tests just shown. The thermal throttle in extreme mode must have only been small, because the clock speed boost is only like 30 MHz or so when we max out the fan, at least in my testing where I'm using a 21 degrees Celsius ambient room temperature. Generally a 1 degree increase to room temp will increase the internals by 1 degree too. So while the reported temperature of the GPU can't go higher, more throttling and less performance in warmer environments is possible. Balance mode was limiting the processor to 35 watts while the GPU was running up to its thermal throttle limit. Even with extreme mode without max fans though, the GPU power limit is essentially maxing out, so that confirms it was only a small thermal throttle in this worst case test. The CPU doesn't go above 45 watts by default fault when both the CPU and GPU are active at the same time. But check out the 3070 Ti. It's maxed out at 150 watts, impressive stuff. And I think this makes more sense combined with the 1440p screen. A higher GPU power limit will just help games more compared to boosting the CPU. Other laptops like the Legion 5i Pro can also hit 150 watts with dynamic boost, but they lower to 125 watts with the CPU also active. The GP66 could happily run the GPU at 100 150 watts indefinitely, and this explains the higher GPU temperature. In a CPU-only workload like Cinebench though, the processor is capable of hitting higher power limits. Extreme mode settled in at 75 watts in a long-term test, though balanced wasn't too far off. It's doing alright compared to most other gaming laptops, but it's one of the lower 12th gen results as the ones ahead of it could boost the CPU to 90 watts in this test. Honestly, if you're willing to tweak power limits in the advanced BIOS, you could probably boost boost the GP66 higher, but more on the BIOS soon. Performance drops back when we unplug the charger and run purely off battery power. This seems to hit Intel laptops harder than AMD, as we've got two 8-core machines at the top of the graph now. The single-threaded performance from 12th gen still has a big lead on battery though. Extreme mode gave the best result in an actual game, as you'd expect. It's got both the best cooling and highest power limits. Silent mode was still performing quite well though. Despite the lower CPU power limit there, the GPU was still running at 93 watts in our stress test. So although thermal throttling, this means that GPU heavier games at the native 1440p resolution should still do relatively well with quieter fans, but at the expense of a warmer machine. The keyboard was below the usual low 30 degrees Celsius I typically see with most laptops when just sitting there idle. It gets about 10 degrees warmer to the touch with the stress tests going in silent mode. It definitely felt warm to the touch, but as we saw, it could still game well enough here so a warmer machine is the trade-off. Stepping up to balanced mode was similar, low 40s towards the center of the back half of the keyboard. The highest extreme mode was similar with the fan on automatic, and then noticeably cooler with the fans maxed out, but they get very loud at full speed. Let's have a listen. The fan speed kept changing when just sitting there idle and not doing anything at all, so that could be annoying. The fans get louder in the higher performance modes when under load as you'd expect. 
And although Max fans were able to remove thermal throttling, they're quite a bit louder compared to most other laptops I've tested. Given my thermal throttle was only small, it's probably possible to customize the fan speed to not have them quite as loud, but that would of course depend on factors like the room temperature and the workload being run. Most people aren't fully maxing out their CPU and GPU at the same time. Most games just don't behave this way. Now let's find out how this year's GP66 actually performs in games and compares against other laptops. Tops. We'll look at both 1080p and 1440p resolutions as the GP66 is available with both. Cyberpunk 2077 was tested the same on all laptops, and I've got this year's GP66 shown by the red highlight. This is an excellent result, it's only behind the higher tier RTX 3080 Ti with double the VRAM and higher GPU power limits in the more expensive GE76, also from MSI or the Razer Blade 17. The GP66 is reaching a 12% higher average FPS compared to the Legion 5i Pro with the same CPU and GPU, which must be a result result of the 20% higher GPU power limit. We've got a different selection of machines at the higher 1440p resolution, as we only test laptops that can actually run it. The GP66 was still holding up incredibly well. Again, only the Blade 17, more expensive GE76, and desktop replacement X170 were ahead. It's only 6 FPS or so ahead of our other best 3070 Ti result, but percentage-wise, this is still an 11% gain. Not bad at all, considering they both have the same CPU and GPU. Control is also a GPU heavy game, even at 1080p, and the full powered 3070 Ti is clearly why the GP66 is so high up on the list again. I suppose it does also have a small GPU overclock by default, but I don't really find those to matter too much generally. This time it's just 5.5% ahead of the Legion 5i Pro with the same CPU and GPU combination, so less of a gap, but still easily a better result. At the higher 1440p resolution, the GP66 was now just 4 FPS ahead of the same spec 5i Pro, but in terms of a percent, it's the same performance gap as we saw at 1080p. I should also note that the 5i Pro has newer DDR5 memory, while the GP66 is using older DDR4, so this could be a factor too. I will compare DDR4 and DDR5 in the same laptop chassis soon. Make sure you're subscribed for that comparison. If you want to see how well the GP66 performs in more games, check out this video after the review. View. We've tested 10 plus games at the native 1440p resolution at all setting presets with features like DLSS, FSR, and ray tracing. So that should give you the best idea of how well this thing performs. Here are the 3D mark results for those that find them useful. Now for some content creator tests. Adobe Premiere was tested with the Puget Systems benchmark, and the GP66 was able to get us one of the highest results. It's slightly behind the Legion 5i Pro, but I'd say that's within the margin of error range. Otherwise, only the more expensive and bigger GE76 was ahead in first place. The score drops back quite a bit in Adobe Photoshop when compared to the same selection of laptops. I mean, it's still going to run Photoshop perfectly fine, but it is the lowest Intel 12th gen score so far, and I'm not quite sure why. Perhaps it's the DDR4 memory. The high wattage GPU is able to get the GP66 back towards the top of the graph in DaVinci Resolve. It's basically scoring the same as the Legion 5i Pro with the same CPU and GPU now, both of which are only beaten by higher tier i9 and 3080 Ti options. I've also tested SpecViewPerf, which tests out various professional 3D workloads. Although both M.2 slots support fast PCIe Gen 4 storage, we're not seeing much faster than Gen 3 speeds with the installed 1TB SSD. Don't get me wrong, these speeds are still great, it just might be another place where costs are cut in the GP model compared to GE. Like other MSI laptops, you can press this epic cheat code to unlock the advanced BIOS, which gives you access to change pretty much anything. Be careful if you don't know what you're doing here though, as bad settings could brick the machine, but if you're a tweaker, there are far more options available compared to most other laptops. By default, TCC offset is set to 5, so you could increase that to manually lower the thermal throttle limit for example. Linux support was tested on Pop! OS 21.10, though the ISO with Nvidia drivers failed to boot until I turned off Optimus in the BIOS. Anyway, the keyboard, touchpad, camera, ethernet, and Wi-Fi all worked fine. The screen brightness shortcuts, keyboard brightness shortcuts, and max fan shortcuts also work. But I couldn't get the speakers to work no matter what I did, even after following a troubleshooting guide for Pulse Audio. Let's discuss pricing and availability next. This will of course change over time, so refer to those links in the description for updates. At the time of recording,
recording a similar configuration to what I've tested but with half the SSD space and 1080p screen goes for $2100 US dollars at Best Buy. But they're known for frequently running sales and more models get added over time, so again check the link in the description for deals. Overall, MSI's GP66 is a great gaming laptop. Despite being a cut down version of the higher tier GE66, it still has a screen with fast response time, a GPU with high power limit and a mock switch. And those three features combined together equal a great gaming experience. So in terms of what this thing is actually designed to do, which is gaming, it's doing pretty well. But that said, the higher tier GE66 does have more features if you need them. Just to name a few, the higher tier GE66 has a bigger battery, Thunderbolt, an SD card slot, a higher quality camera, DDR5 memory instead of DDR4, and perhaps most importantly of all, no flashy RGB light bar on the front. If any of those things are important to you, then you'll probably want to consider spending more money on the more expensive GE66. And of course this also means that if the GE6 is a similar price to the GP66 or perhaps cheaper, then the GE66 is definitely worth picking over the GP66. Basically the GE version should have everything here but with extras. I'm not sure how much I'd pay for those extras, maybe if it was like 100 bucks or something. For a machine I'm going to keep around for 3, 4 or 5 years, I'd probably just pay it and get the GE version. But that's just me and of course it depends on your budget and what the price difference actually is. Despite a number of sacrifices being made with the GP version, I was still surprised to see that it had the perky RGB keyboard and 2.5 gigabit ethernet, as both of those are generally considered to be more premium features. The GP66 did have some thermal throttling in a worst case stress test, though in most games I wouldn't really expect that in practice, though the fans could still get quite loud. But still, those gaming results speak for themselves. The GP66 is an excellent performer. Come and check out how MSI's GP66 performs in 13 different games in this video next. We've tested it at the native 1440p resolution with features like DLSS, FSR and ray tracing to really give you an idea of what to expect. Otherwise if you're new to the channel make sure you get subscribed for future laptop reviews like this one.